-hmm. So I started doing it between here and Seattle on a weekly basis. And, you know, like the, the Flying Other Brothers name basically became, became my lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So this is all about you, our podcast about your journey in music and how you got to where you are now. And we'll talk about the, the record you just put out. Okay. Okay, cool. Cool. Awesome. Well, first off, tell me where were you born and raised? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a Navy brat. My dad uh, was moved all over the place. We, uh, I went to 12 different schools by the time I graduated high school. Oh, wow. Um, but yeah, so born in, uh, in Salisbury, Maryland. We were living at a Navy base uh, called Chincoteague. But the... Um, you know, the, the musical part of things kind of started when uh, when we were based in Jacksonville, Florida. Okay. And uh, and I guess, uh, what, my mom bought a banjo when I was about five. And uh, she bought it to like, you know, she's, she was always an avid lover of music. Not that much of a musician, but she bought this thing to tinker with. And pretty soon it kind of became my best friend. <laughs> oh wow! So you started on banjo. Yeah, that was the very first thing that I, you know, just started like trying to tune and figure out how, you know, how notes relate to each other, and you know, figure out the mechanics and all. But the 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 passion, uh, I think, really, uh, mostly, I, you know, she loved music and she was always exposing me to it. The woman that raised her was actually the maid of her family in Pensacola, Florida, a woman named Ollie Mae Bradley. And she, after she made breakfast, she'd turn on the, the radio in the kitchen and I would, I'd sit there with her and listen to Sam Cooke and Wilson Pickett and these guys uh, until somebody said, hey, it's time to go out and do something different. <laughs> And it was just always, music was always for me a sonic mystery. And, uh, you know, the, the ability to have these emotions about something that didn't necessarily have any words. Although, you know, the, the, the most accessible music and I think some of the greatest music has, has been a combination of the sounds and the rhythms and and the, you know the harmonic structure and a great message you know because sure the, yeah with um with the 12 schools you went to i mean over the course of before you graduate high school are you like at a new school what every it sounds i mean every year essentially right yeah so so some repeat years i had uh at the same school but otherwise it was often you know move during the middle of the year or move in the summer wow was yeah. that hard to like, you know, make different friend groups every year? So here's the thing that happens. Um, uh, what I found was that among the Navy brats, the kids that had been moved around this way, basically you kind of you kind of develop one or another approach. One approach is just to be resentful, and you know, kind of like. Okay, you know, I'm following my dad all around. You, in, in most cases, it was dad who was the who was the military guy, um, and uh, and I resent having to you know get stuck in a new place. And mm -hmm. so you know, there's there's sort of a a resentment that builds up in you know some many of my friends had this sort of attitude about it, you know. Um, and then there was the, the attitude of, well, I'm plucked in a new, you know, I'm planted in a new environment. Mm -hmm. I got to make friends as fast as I can. Who knows how long this is going to last? But I definitely uh, got into the second category, which was, OK, you know, this is part of the adventure. And, um, you know, who do I like here and who do I want to spend my time with? And and let's get going. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to look at it. I would imagine it being hard, especially towards the end of your high school years, not being able to like build this real tight core group of people that you're going to graduate with and you've known, you know, at least the last four years. Um, was that, I'm sure that was probably yeah. pretty difficult to deal with. So we, we got moved senior year of high school. Um, <laughs> oh. And, and uh, that was very interesting because 
um, probably the most formative event in my career, both my musical career and my tech career, mm -hmm. um, was a time in uh, late in the freshman year of high school. Um, I was learning how to play trumpet. I was in a beginning band and the uh, this school uh, it was called Fort Hunt High School in Alexandria, Virginia. It turned out to be one of the best uh, music programs uh, in public education. Uh, wow! Superb, superb school. So I'm in beginning band, and the and the band director uh, is you know teaching this beginning band group and says, "Watch this. You play what's on the page, and I'll make up something that goes along with it." And I said, "Well." how about you play what's on the page and I'll make up something that goes along with it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that night he called my parents and he, uh, he had a little conference and he said, listen, uh, if you can do this, we're going to get your son a professional symphony trumpet and we're going to get him the director of the uh, Air Force Band as his private instructor, trumpet instructor, and we're just going to see, you know, see how quickly he can develop. And he put me into the, the symphonic band the next year. I was, you know, like the last chair. I was still trying to figure out how to buzz my lips. But, mm -hmm. but I had in my head, you know, what I, was, what I was trying to do musically. And he loved that. And it basically, you know, to, to within high school, I mean, lots of people have had this experience in various, you know, whether it's sports or some particular academics, but mm -hmm. to be in high school and have somebody say, you can be professional at this, you, you know, you got to really focus, mm -hmm. but go for it. And then, you know, to, to get those kinds of results within a year or two, um, you know, it, it changes your life to know what's possible with focus. Sure. So then, so then comes senior year of high school. My dad got transferred again. And so, and so, so here, you know, I'm like first chair in this symphonic, you know, the best symphonic band in the, uh, in the high school world. Right. Um, the, uh, the prospect of moving back to California where we had lived before. And I always knew that California really, uh, was my home because uh, I just I just loved it from the first time we moved out here when I was about seven. Mm -hmm. But the prospect of moving away from that band was like, you know, a major fork in my life. Now, it, so it turns out that one of the first people that I met in California, senior year of high school, turned out to be my life partner, Cynthia. Oh, um, wow. So so it was a very fateful move. Sure. But but I've told people if I ever write a novel, I can tell you what it's going to be about. It's going to be about what would have happened had I stayed with the family who invited me to stay in, in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. Oh, you had a family that invited you to stay there, what, so you could pursue the trumpet? Yeah, and I, and I was planning on doing that. And then I sort of chickened out like, okay, you know, I know I, know I love California. I love my family, so I'm not going to mm -hmm. go out on that limb. And did you move to San Francisco or where did you move? Yeah, Alameda. Oh, wow. Okay. I lived in the Bay Area for a little bit too. Oh, okay. I was on the radio up there for a handful of years. And Cool. That's cool. So Alameda. Wow. And how long yeah, were you so, in Alameda County for? So, so we, we moved to Alameda. Um, I you know, jo joined the band in that group. You know, it kind of became a star because I knew what you know, I, I knew how this all this worked mm -hmm. and a lot of the kids just hadn't been woke about, you know, what is possible in music. Right. So so I, I played a lot of music there, but um, then uh, applied to Stanford and it was, you know, an another really formative event for me was uh, to arrive at Stanford, put my guitar down on my bed and look at the other bed in the room and there's this nice Gibson case and uh, this guy this guy comes back hi I'm Don Morris I'm your roommate we open up the cases and just started like tinkering together and and almost instantly he was like well you can sing on pitch you know harmonize with me become, mm -hmm. become a singer and then we became a duo and we you know he he had done uh, he had done folk duo stuff in Denver 
on television and been recorded. Wow. He was, you know, he was like another, you know, basically professional already. Mm -hmm. So he, he pulled me into this uh, guitar and singing world, you know, performing. Whereas before that, I really had only performed on trumpet. Well, yeah, right. You were more in an orchestral band and then now you're in a folk duo. Yeah. What was yeah. it? What was it like trans like doing? I'm sure it had to be totally different. Like, was it hard to get the hang of now you're playing with just one other person and you're probably writing your own songs versus doing what the, the school orchestra was performing? Yeah. The, so the first the first thing that I wrote actually was a fanfare for the school symphonic band. Oh, wow. In fact, I just a couple weeks ago, I got a message uh, from a guy who had who had listened to one of the things that we've put out recently. Mm -hmm. And he says, you may remember me. I'm Harry Blake. I was your band director at Fort Hunt. I want you to know that that fanfare that you wrote, I've been using it to open concerts ever since. Whoa, that's <laughs> rad. That's amazing. Your legacy lives on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so writing was not entirely new to me. Okay. R writing lyrics was. Yeah, All I, right. I don't know if you, uh, I don't know if you want to hear that fanfare. I think I, I've got it. It's yeah, like, I'd love to hear it. Okay, it's like, it's like. Uh, maybe just 16 bars, but uh, let me see if I, if I, let's see, I have to share my computer audio. How does that work here on Zoom? Um, let's see, there is a. If you click, there it goes. Oh, you did something. Yeah, so. Okay, let's just try this. All right. See if you hear this. I do. It's low, but I can hear it. So maybe you know if, if if you want me to send you a file that you to dub that up uh, yeah so later that'd we be can cool. do that okay I'll do that but yeah that that was the first thing I wrote wow <laughs> that's crazy I mean I could hear it faintly and it sounds that's really cool so you wrote that on the trumpet yeah it was I orchestrated it you know it's, oh it's, yeah it's yeah. got this score you know of, of twelve lines each of which is a different uh, part or section okay. Um, wow. yeah, yeah. So, so that was, you know, in terms of, in terms of writing, composing original music, that was the first thing that I did. Amazing. And when, when you attended Stanford, were you going there for music or were you going there for computer science? Cause I know you were in the, the, the computer world. I ended up in the computer world. The, I, I went to Stanford thinking that I would either become a musician or an architect. Okay. Um, and they closed the architecture program when I was a freshman. So they stopped oh, offering wow. architecture degrees. So uh, I actually, um, you know, asked around and there was a thing called product design, which is an engineering program, which is kind of, you know, somebody said, well, architecture is designing things that you that you go into and interact with around you and product mm -hmm. design is designing things that you interact with, but you know, you're, you're generally, you're holding them in your hands or you're driving them or whatever. So, so check out product design. And I got smitten just with the idea of designing things to be, to interact with. Wow. And, and that's, and that's how I ended up in computers because it was, you know, desktop computers were just emerging. Mm -hmm. uh, at, in 1979 is when I graduated. When I graduated, uh, I knew that I knew that music was going to be my way of life. I had already made a record album by the time. Oh, you had? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so 
So some, some of this folk stuff and just some of the other things that I uh, really loved about music that I had heard all kind of got internalized into this. I spent the summer developing this album. Um, it's called Take Me Home. You can, I mean, you can find it anywhere. It's, mm -hmm. been, it's been relicensed several times, um, most recently by Numero Records, who okay. is a, <clears throat> a pretty hip label that basically likes to reach back into things that never got much attention, but that, that people consider collector's items. That's cool that you're yeah. lumped into that. It was yeah. that with the Flying Other Brothers, or is that a different project? No, this is way, way before. Yeah. Okay, this is when I was when I was finishing school. So, um, yeah, so you know, if you if you go to buy a copy of this piece of vinyl, it's between two or three hundred bucks a copy. Wow, it's like, you know, one of those, <laughs> one of those, you know, get a load of this. You know, this sure. guy this guy made this in his basement with just one tape deck, you know, it's that kind of stuff. That's cool. But, um, yeah, so the, you mentioned the Flying Other Brothers. Yeah. The, after college, uh, huh. I really, um, musically I was mostly doing things with the kids because we had children and, mm -hmm. you know, singing lullabies and helping them do, you know, music for minors and you know all this sort of stuff participating but not driving anything mm -hmm. uh musically but keeping it alive but then uh in uh in the late 90s when the kids were getting into high school and um i was helping out with like we took uh brandon's jazz band uh our son brandon's jazz band we took him to cuba and uh, you know i helped out with that stuff um and uh but but what started happening was having enough room in our lifestyle that I could start really participating in performing concerts again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was the about the time I met Bill Bennett and Roger McNamee and uh, um, you know all these guys that I ended up uh, forming a band with called the Flying Other Brothers. And the Flying Other Brothers is the, you know, of the box set. We did this retrospective box mm -hmm. set uh, just a couple months ago. We released it. Mm -hmm. It contains um, eight songs that were Flying Other Brothers releases, just kind of representing each songwriter. But it also, it has another album, which is eight songs of Flying Other Brothers material that never got released which is really interesting material. And mm -hmm. then the third album in this box set is basically Grateful Dead themed material that has happened mostly since the Flying Other Brothers. So that has, oh, okay. that has been a thread that I have continued um, in concerts and, uh, and in recording. Um, so so the, the box set is, you know, it pulls together, basically it's a genre mm -hmm. and a particular group of people that I've shared that genre with over the last 20 years, really. That's, wow. what, that, that's what the box set was about. And, okay. it was, and it was also about, you know, digging through the archives and finding that there was so much material that deserved to be, you know, that deserved to be noticed. Like... Mm -hmm like uh, um, Jesse Cutler, who I think helped, uh, who introduced yeah, yeah, us. Who, yeah, yeah. he also, he sent some of this stuff to Rolling Stone magazine and they're like, well, yeah, this is amazing. So they, you know, they did a feature for one of the tunes that I had recorded uh, with Bob Weir, just mm -hmm. duo in his, uh, in his studio. Yeah, I it's saw a, that, you did the Imagine cover, right? Yeah, and, and especially, you know, given that there was one of these we are the world imagine covers that had like everybody each person sings a line and they way over sing it and it's got all this production and you know there's <laughs> you know it ends with you know 30 people in the room i thought you know it, it's probably a good time to remind people you know like what's at the very core of this tune which mm -hmm. is the you know those those sort of slightly quirky chords and those beautiful words. And, you know, it's just a song, you know, so just paring it down to the absolute minimum is the, 
is the way that we had done it. And I thought, oh, you know, it's a good time for that. Mm -hmm. with the, with I, the, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to ask. I'm curious to know, like with the Flying Other Brothers, that band started when you said your kids were got a little older in high school. Was this a yep. band that you were just doing side to your your career in, in computers? And like, how did the, that band form and kind of take off, so to speak? Yeah, yeah. So the, um, I mean, I, I've always seen life in phases, you know, mm -hmm. like, like when you have kids, that's your number one thing. You may mm -hmm. be, a, you may be a songwriter, you know, you, you may be a computer technologist, but you know, when you're raising kids, you got to recognize that that's the number one thing for some sure. period of time. And, um, so, you know, dur during that phase, the early 90s, it was, you know, really so focused on that. Well, as, as we started to have more room for other things in life, I think, you know, I think there was a, a fair number of techies who were going through the same phase. I mean, uh, there were a lot of bands started in Silicon Valley and, you know, so, uh, some of them people would call like vanity projects, you know, just like, you know, getting out and partying with your with your friends and being able to play the top 40 hits that, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, in some ways we started that way. But we found there was so much songwriting talent and so much um, imagination in this band that it really took off. Um, and so, yeah, the the uh, the Flying Other Brothers initially we were, you know, okay, let's, you know, let's do trade shows, let's do, you know, local events. And then it was, you know, let's, let's have, uh, let's see if we can do something at Great American Music Hall, do something at mm -hmm. Slim's, do something at the Fillmore. Then, you know, let's go on the road. Um, let's do some political fundraisers, you know, let's do uh another album yes another album another album we did we actually put out four albums during that period of time wow wow yeah, is it hard to juggle like everything the family and, and oh that, man and the, <laughs> and the oh, career man. yeah 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 so you know luckily the kids were able to join you know it's a it's a uh um pretty wholesome group of people so the kids joined us a lot uh, we toured around, we, we toured Alaska four times, I think, you know, the kids, wow. the kids came with us all four of those times, the juggle. So I think, um, I was very, very fortunate in that during the time when I was really ramping up on this musical touring, mm -hmm. I also was pretty far along in the development of what I believed to be the next phase in the computer industry development, which was, and this is, this is something that I always dreamed about and eventually was able to prototype and work on directly, which is the ability to take the computer and just pick it up and interact directly with the screen. So that, you know, that was a theme in my technical development. There, you, you may remember there was a time when there weren't flat panel displays. Right. And so the, so the very first high resolution, full color flat panel displays, the very first one that was actually marketed as a desktop product, mm -hmm. we did it at Silicon Graphics. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know, there, there were flat panel displays, but they were really prototypes until we were able to market this thing as a workstation display, as a, as a PC display. That was in 1994, I think. Um, and then one of the first things, and, and, you know, so part of that was just making it something that you could pick up, right? Uh -huh. You know, so, the, you know, the evolution of portable computers, um, you know, laptops always had to have flat panel displays, but the, you know, the kind of resolution and color that was required for a, uh, f for a desktop computer and in particular a graphics workstation, things that we take for granted now, right. that, that, that required 
you know, a whole bunch more technology packed into that display than had been done before. Wow. Um, so uh, one of the first things that, that I started working on once we had that flat panel display was capacitive digitizers, which that this is the technology that is in every touchscreen product, you know, all, you know, all the smartphones, mm -hmm. um, all the tablets started working on interacting directly with the display and built a prototype of that stuff. Um, I, sh I actually shopped this around because it, it didn't actually belong inside of Silicon Graphics um, product family. Mm -hmm. It was just something that I, I told the board, you know, I, I'm so excited about being able to interact directly with the display and the potential for that, the potential to manipulate things and capture ideas, you know, expressively with a pen. Mm -hmm. um, I was so excited about that stuff. I knew that it wasn't really in SGI's product line, but they were like, well, you know, go ahead and develop it. Pretty soon I realized, oh, what they were doing was, you know, see, seeing if I could develop, if my team could develop something that actually had intellectual property value. Mm -hmm. And so once we had done our prototypes, the, um, the SGI uh, management said, Great. See, see if you can find somebody to buy this from us. Oh, wow. So, so the first person I went to was Steve Jobs. Because, really? Because I knew him well. And, and basically he said, I love your display stuff. We're never going to do a tablet. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. What and, year was this? Uh, 1997. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So this so, is pre everything they've done. I mean, pre iPhone, pre yeah, iPad, yeah, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um, I, at that time I was like, well, I, you know, I can't let go of this. So I'm not just going to work on displays. I got to work on this other stuff. Mm -hmm. We shot. So Jeff Hawkins, who did the Palm pilot that he was like the second person that I went to, you know, cause I was, I was looking for allies, people who could help us, you know, start something. Um, John Doerr uh, at Kleiner Perkins. Um, basically, I went all the way up and down Sand Hill Road uh, mm -hmm. look, looking for, you know, who, who wants to help me spin this out of Silicon Graphics? And then somebody said, well, you, you need somebody with, you know, somebody who's really hardware focused. And, and the venture capital community these days thinks that hardware is so difficult to do you should you know find some big hardware company so i went and took it to michael dell and i you know i took my prototypes and demonstrated in his uh in his little office there um in austin and he says have you spoken with microsoft and i was like well you know I, i'm not real impressed with the products that microsoft puts out um, I'm, and I'm a Silicon Valley guy. And he says, well, th th this isn't going to go anywhere unless it's running office. So you better talk to Microsoft. So then I went up to Microsoft and uh, it became clear that uh, not only had Silicon Graphics found its buyer, but that Bill Gates was really, really excited about this stuff. Whoa! So that's how I <laughs> so so that's how I got to know him, and I joined oh Microsoft, gosh. but I was a Silicon Valley guy, so my my work life was in starting in 1998 when I joined Microsoft. My work life was like what people's work lives are now during the pandemic, where you're home most of the time. And you're going into the office for small amounts of time to get together with, uh, you know, your coworkers. So you were essentially re working remotely 25 years ago. <laughs> yeah, and and remote very quickly became often on the road. Uh huh. So these these I got really lucky. These things dovetailed. I mean, uh, Roger McNamee, my bandmate, he had he had commuted weekly from Swarthmore, where his wife, my other bandmate, Ann McNamee, mm -hmm. um, 
uh, lived. He had been commuting out here and, you know, he had kind of demonstrated that, yeah, there's, there's a fair amount of playing time, but you can do this on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. So I started doing it between here and Seattle on a weekly basis. And, you know, like the, the flying other brothers name basically became, became my lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That is an incredible story. It was oh wild, but, you know, not a great carbon footprint, I'm afraid, uh, because, you know, a, a weekly flight to Seattle was, was putting a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. But, but it, it, on the side, I mean, the, the display that you created, I mean, makes up for it, I think, in the carbon footprint world now, because it's just everyone can be right there mobily and communicating instead of flying. You know hey, what I mean? Hey, it was, yeah, it, was, off. <laughs> it was, it was worth the investment. Right, yeah, right. And, oh, my. Yeah. Wow. So, so during that time frame, that was, you know, that was when the Flying Other Brothers took off. And, um, and we played together for the better part of a decade. Um, and then, uh, you know, any number of factors. It was a large band. Mm -hmm. um, there were differences in goals as to where we wanted to take the music. And so eventually we kind of felt like, oh, that's run its course. And then the other thing that was going really strong in that time frame was our daughter, Megan, was blossoming as a singer-songwriter. And she's an incredible singer-songwriter. Um, wow. So I started focusing my music on helping Megan. And, you know, we did we did hundreds of shows together. She's she's got four gorgeous albums out. Um, one one of the tunes that uh, she wrote uh, ended up getting picked up by T-Bone Burnett for the Hunger Games project. Wow, um, that's huge. Other other songs that she's written have been licensed for in you know film and tv she's uh she's been on uh the kqed california report many times uh sasha coco over there um loves megan they love each other so they mm -hmm. you know there's so megan has a has just an incredible uh singer songwriter life she also has the the two track life by the way okay you know, this this thing Tech that world? i <laughs> L landscape architecture really yeah yeah that's really cool that is really cool so this this box set that you guys put out was is based on songs that you had written with the flying other brothers that's right okay uh, yeah uh, that plus some grateful dead material okay yeah. and how did you meet bob weir uh through actually playing up at sweetwater one one day we were playing up at Sweetwater in Mill Valley, and uh, he came by the Sweetwater, and he's he said, "Hey, can I can I go get my my amp and my wife?" <laughs> went up went up the hill, brought him down because we were playing a bunch of dead tunes, and uh -huh. you know he he liked how we sounded, and and you know, you know there was there was some a few situations where we basically became his backup band, and it was uh, it was some of the most thrilling stuff because. We knew his material very well, um, and when he when he would front the band, you know, it, it gave it a real, you know, a, a pretty powerful focal point, and so that we could all basically lock in as an ensemble behind him. Some, I think, some of the best stuff that we did as a band was where there was a rock star you know, de delivering the words and we were creating the, you know, the cauldron of, of, of interaction between musicians and the groove and just focused on that. Mm -hmm. I think that, that probably was the strongest suit. I, you know, I'm a pretty good guitarist, but I'm not a virtuoso and I don't really, you know, for me, it's always in service of the song. Mm -hmm. So when Bobby and I are the two guitarists, I'm like, well, you know, let's let your rhythm spikes and the things that you do, let's let that drive, you know, how I respond rather than just saying, okay, I'm taking my solo. I'll hand it back to the, to the lyrics when I'm done with my solo. Right, right. Wow. So it, be it becomes much more conversational when mm -hmm. you take that approach, when you say, okay, you know, let's, 
let's take the elements that are naturally coming out in a rhythm section and build on those and you know and see how we can morph the song and morph the music uh you know taking the ingredients that just bubble up naturally mm -hmm. what yeah. was it like was the first time you met him in mill valley when he was at the show yeah yeah wow was it hard? like obviously you probably recognized him and was it hard to or were you nerve wracked to like starstruck when you see him and you're playing his songs uh i th i think you you know you put on a there's a level of concentration basically it just uh -huh. ups your level of concentration it's like you know well, you know, you, you have to be much more intentional about everything you do when you when you know that there's a real judge of what you're doing. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like the judge. Right. I mean, they're his songs. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. And, and and, you know, I mean, that that has been. That's been a really important part of musical development for me. And, you know, th th people will say, oh, you got to you just got to keep playing with the best musicians you can you just got to keep focusing on you know getting with the best people you can and you know part of that is because of what it does to your own psychology mm -hmm. the the extent to which those people being present causes you to focus what you're doing in order to satisfy them you know and so mm -hmm. so it, you know i mean music is such a collaborative communal thing I mean, I, you know, I think that this son, I mentioned this sonic mystery that I've always mm -hmm. felt about music. Well, at the core of that mystery is the fact that without words, you can communicate such emotion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that is, you know, perhaps it's a byproduct of our language brains. Like, you know, so much of this gray matter is focused on on communication and so you know may, maybe a byproduct of of our language skill is having developed this emotional language well notice that like in all world cultures there is the ability to emotionally reach people of other cultures without any words mm -hmm. so you know there's there's just this there's this magical thing that is, you know, perhaps it's just a result of how our brains work, but the, the nonverbal communication of emotion that can happen in music, that's the sonic mystery, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just a, it's a wonderful that. thing. Yeah, that's so true, so true, I love that. And the box set you guys put out is out now, and then aside, you said there's Grateful Dead songs, and obviously the Imagine cover, and uh, there, some old, and unreleased some, songs so, so we uh in 2019 i was asked to do a performance for our college reunion stuff at oh Stanford. wow okay and and i knew that there was a thread that really deserved to be the the center of a concert which is stanford and psychedelia mm -hmm. because i mean you know Independent of the fact that this 1979 album I'd made is called one of the last pieces of the psychedelic folk era, the beginning of psychedelia in music and in technology really kind of traces back to Stanford. In, in 1960, Ken Kesey was a grad student at Stanford. And, um, you know, he, he was... I mean, yes, these guys were experimenting with LSD, but they were also, you know, I mean, further is not. So psychedelia, mm -hmm. the root of psychedelia is being outside ordinary trains of thought. And, you know, that can be stimulated by drugs, but it's more about, you know, thinking outside the box. And so, you know, in the in the evolution of the counterculture, you know, from Stanford goes Ken Kesey up into the hills having these, these uh, acid test parties and then taking this bus across the country that, you know, that, uh, that trip led to the Beatles doing their magical mystery tour and the, the sound man of the band that was at Ken Kesey's tests 
mm-hmm. was this guy, Owsley Stanley. Um, he was the sound man for the Grateful Dead, and he, he, you know, turned on people like the Birds down in Southern California, who really came up with the first psychedelic pop hit, which is Eight Miles High. Interesting. Uh, and so that you know, there is this, there is this seeding and propagating in pop culture that really traces its roots back to Stanford. Mm-hmm. Then, then there is this, this thing that I think really is only now starting to get re-internalized by society, which is what psychedelics, psychedelic drugs do in terms of changing people's minds. Mm-hmm. So there, uh, when I came to Stanford and when I joined this product design program, the professors and the and the you know like deans the people running the program were people who had participated in basically engineering acid tests at Sta- yeah at Stanford and in Menlo Park at the Veterans Administration um these these professors were um basically doing tests with some with some students and with some people in industry to see what kind of creative potential could be unlocked by you know by pulling people outside their ordinary trains of thought now you know very soon after that all of all you know psychedelic drugs became illegal you know mm-hmm. schedule 1 um only now has there started to be some legitimate you know, medical testing that starts to, you know, starts to prove, okay, here's what happens, you know, to a person who has fought a smoking addiction all their life mm-hmm. um, on, under, under, you know, LSD therapy. People are able to change their minds about subjects like that, about addictions. And mm-hmm. so, you know, there's... You know, there's this scary idea of rewiring, and then there's this very attractive idea about rewiring things that, you know, unwiring things that you want to get rid of in your own behaviors. That's, so, that's really interesting because that, that you can unlock these certain aspects to your brain that could uh, potentially have you quit. It's like hypnotism where they say that they can hypnotize you out of smoking or out of being addicted to certain things. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, so there has, you know, there's been, you know, research is starting to gather more about, you know, like dealing with post-traumatic stress and just, Mm -hmm. you know, and and just basically changing your mind, you know? So, so it's, you know, (laughs) it's a, it's a, it's a chemical therapy that's involved in people learning how to change their minds on things that they really want to change. So, and, and that thread, which, like I said, you know, it, it kind of unraveled for a long time and now it's starting to get woven back together. Mm-hmm. But that thread was, you know, was partly established at Stanford. Interesting. It, so, so the, the, government program, which was a secret program uh, uh, funded by the CIA, was called uh, MK Ultra. Okay. And, and that project is what had people taking these drugs and, and basically being monitored to see what happens with them. And, and that, that was, you know, the roots of some of the creative thinking in product design and the, you know, Creative thinking, I, 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 yeah, I would, I would say that you know there was a, a, a special kind of creativity coming out of Ken Kesey and the Grateful Dead and you know the mm-hmm. people involved in this stuff. So, so yeah, so so in in um, in the evolution of psychology and in the evolution of pop culture were these two things that kind of came out of Stanford. Mm-hmm. So Stanford and psychedelia was a concert that we did in uh, 2019 and two of the songs on 
to fi- to finally answer your question, two of the songs in this yeah, box that was set. Fascinating. <laughs> I didn't realize they did all that. Yeah. So two of the songs uh, uh, on this box set were ri- written by Robert Hunter. Okay. Um, and there were uh, performances at that uh, Stanford and Psychedelia concert. That is in, really in really in twenty nineteen. Cool. Okay. And then, and then an- another Grateful Dead piece is just that, um, you know, during the pandemic, basically, if you're performing, you're kind of performing alone. You can try to sync up, you can, you know, piece together these videos and all, but you're kind of alone with your stuff. And so I, I one night I did a, a Terrapin station. I just, you know, turned on the recorder um, and did a... a a version of Terrapin Station, which turned out to be about 26 minutes long, I think. <laughs> oh, I think I saw it on Spotify. It's, yeah, it's it, about almost it, 25 minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's it's solo. Uh, with, I, I had a drum machine and a loop pedal, and I just I just went for it, and it go, it goes all over the place. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's definitely outside ordinary trains of thought. <laughs> That's cool. I'll so have that, to take a listen to it. I did see it on there. I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Give it a listen and, and give yourself some time because it really percolates and then gets to a boil and then kind of takes off and comes That's back amazing. around. It's, it's really, it's so fun just to, you know, whether you're, whether by yourself or with other musicians, it's mm-hmm. so fun to morph things. That is so cool. And are you, are you, aside from this project you were able to put together, are you working on, are you still writing music or doing uh, shows or? Yeah, I, um, I, I'm more so, you know, songwriting. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's the toughest thing in music. And, and it, not that it's tough to pull together the ingredients and cook something, but it's, it's, uh first of all for it to for people to latch on to it it has to stimulate their imaginations so you know you can't just be describing something that you know mm-hmm. you you've you've got to be you've got to be tapping into what other people are feeling and so you know a, you know to write a great song means to write something that people will adopt as their own mm-hmm and so you know that that gets into either just having faith in where they are or actually knowing where they are you know it's that uh, is a challenge and then today there is so much music being made and it's coming and, and it's showing up in so many different channels that a fundamental aspect of what we think of as songwriting has been lost which is the amount of repetition with which you will hear a a particular tune that that allows you to become more and more familiarized uh, and and to internalize so um we it's it's almost impossible to get a tune played for an individual more than a dozen times now Mm -hmm. you know you you just it's it, it doesn't happen like even the most emotionally powerful ways that songs are presented, which is like in a movie where there's a, you know, like a where, dramatic scene or something. Yeah. Yeah. Ties it, it all in. But you don't watch that movie a dozen times. Right. You know, the, the radio used to play a song a dozen times a day. It still does. <laughs> it, do, it does. Oh. But, but, who, but, who's, but who's listening to the radio? <laughs> but who's listening to the radio? There you go. And, and you know, you, you look at Spotify and, it, you know, it is just, it's a complete world. You know, there's so much great music being made, you know, sonically great. But how does it, how does it, you know, how does it get embedded in people's minds through repetition? And that's just really hard to come by now. Mm-hmm. So, so I have, um, I've been more and more involved in interpreting existing music I like and, that. and in particular for the last four years, I've dove deep into jazz. Cool. We've put out 
uh, well, we've we have two albums uh, with two completely different groups of people uh, that I engineered and we released um, right before the pandemic, and then we have a third in the works right now, which is basically interpretation of Beatles tunes. Really, um, that's really cool. And and uh, it. It follows this thread of morphing from one thing to another to another to another. So both on, on guitar and on trumpet, I've really been focusing on kind of the outer reaches of the sonic mystery where the, you know, the complexity is super high and yet people still relate to it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the world of jazz. And I uh, love that. That's, well, there, that's where I've been spending most of my time. Very, very cool. Well, Bert, thank you so much for, for doing this. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you asking. Yeah, of course. I do have one more question for you. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Oh, well, <clears throat> I, I think that just, just knowing that almost anything is possible with, with full focus is probably the most important thing. I, you know, what I would adv advise people to do is to recognize that if they have a dream, you know, about a particular song, about, about making a particular song an anthem, um, there is a way to do that, but it just requires being fully focused, fully aware of every aspect of that song every aspect of what you're trying to create and just making it absolutely the best you possibly can. And I, and I think that's, you know, that's true for songwriting. That's true for, for performing. Um, you know, it's, it is, it is a craft, which the more of your mind you can engage in that act, the better, you know, the more, that. the more of your mind you can in, involve in that act the better and you know we we go through life uh we all go through life partly conscious you know like the you know there's times when you're just sitting back there's times when you're afraid and you're like overly conscious of some particular thing but there there really is a level of concentration and focus that can make great things happen and so, you know, I would encourage, I would encourage all musicians to seek that level of focus in what they do. Bring me the best word.